Hi, AD Boris here. We try to keep our changes to an absolute minimum to let as many people follow along as possible, but we'd be mad not to make any changes whatsoever, and it would inflate every tutorial by 10 minutes to explain where and why the changes are made. So here's a quick overview of the changes we tend to make, and then we'll go over the why. We'll make everything slightly more readable by upping the resolution scale of the display to 1.1, in my case anyway. For the quality of the wireframes, we'll up the multi-sampling to 8. And just a quick addition here, if you don't really rely on this kind of interactive navigation, we can actually switch it off here, or we can just come over and change that to a simple axis, and therefore it takes up far less screen space. The navigation smooth view will set to zero for those instant zoom-ins. Auto depth is a controversial one, but sometimes we'll have that on. The rendering on the GPU will often be set to CUDA with everything checked there. If other options besides CUDA are available, then enable whatever you can there, basically, for rendering speedups. To take advantage of the GPU, we'd switch over to that device. For modeling, though, we'll often find ourselves in the workbench engine. We might give a little color to a material for the viewport display. Typically, we'd want to use our own workspace instead of setting one up every time so duplicating and naming one is a good idea then we'll just keep the windows we need in the workbench solid shading the middle studio lighting option is quite nice and bright and for the workbench rendered view we might go with a slightly shiny matte cap option the shadows will put down to 0.2 the cavity will set to both and for screen space the ridge will put to 0.3 and the valley will have at 0.6 will enable the outline. The background we might slightly lighten and to unify all the viewing modes, we'll change the background option to world. That might have a knock on effect. So lightening the grid slightly could be necessary there. Back face culling I like to have on in both the solid and the rendered modes. And when in EV for that matter, that setting can be found in the material itself. For toggling the wireframe, we assign a shortcut to that and we're using the semicolon key. For add-ons, we'll enable the loop tools add-on, the copy attributes add-on, the bool tool add-on and make sure display as wireframe is set on it will enable f2 and no tutorial would be complete without mentioning the node wrangler and generally import images as planes add-on comes in handy for many jobs too so that's a quick summary that we hope you'll find useful when following along with us and maybe others for that matter so now we'll go into more detail and share some hints and tips along the way most of what we want to tweak here is going to be found in our preferences so let's jump into it we can find preferences at the bottom of the edit menu there, or we can find it at the bottom of our F4 file context menu. In both of those cases, it opens up a floating window. Sometimes I want to tweak the preferences not in a separate window and just keep the cursor focused all on the same version of Blender. So to do that, I'm going to split this 3D view here just by left clicking and dragging towards the left just to duplicate the 3D view. And then instead of the 3D viewport, let's change it to preferences. If you're opening a Blender version for the first time, you'll probably be greeted with a few options that we can find in our key map tab of the user preferences. Things like which key map to use, which we're just using the standard Blender one. We're now selecting with the left mouse and we also get an option to what to do with the spacebar. And there's also a theme option, which we're just going to keep as the standard default theme. Jumping back to the key map though, just a quick note about the spacebar action. For hard surface modeling, for a project like that, you're probably not going to be doing much animation. So to have that set to play might not make that much sense. Maybe it would be better to have it as tools or search instead. But I just wanted to make it clear that all three of those options are still accessible through quick shortcut keys anyway. So as we can see here, spacebar will play. The tools we can bring up with shift space. That's just a reflection of our tools bar that we have here. And for the search, that is going to be found on F3. So personally, I'm going to leave these as default. Here, I just want to add a little quick note to do with any of the user preferences that we actually change in here are going to get automatically saved. That's because of a setting that we can find here in this section here. We just click on this and you can see auto save preferences is enabled by default. So if we want to be changing things around in here and we don't want that to happen, we don't want to save those changes, we can uncheck that and then just manually do that ourselves with save preferences. All right, so with all that out of the way, let's get into some changes. So first of all, with our interface tab, the resolution scale, I'm going to take that up to something like 1.1 just to make it everything a little bit easier to read. But again, this is personal preference depending on how far away your monitor is and things like this. Also bear in mind that it's possible to hold control and middle click 
And if you move the mouse up and down, you'll be able to scale individual panels there. Next, a little note about region overlap. Back in the older versions of Blender, this wasn't on by default, but now it is. And you can see if we take that off, our side panels, such as the toolbar and the sidebar itself, will kind of clip parts of the 3D view there. Whereas if we enable region overlap, we get a little bit of extra space. Next, jumping down to viewport, we can see we have this multi-sampling area set to no multi-sample at the moment. Just to demonstrate this a little bit clearer, I'm just going to close out our sidebars here, delete this cube with X and add in a mesh monkey instead. And then let's come over to wireframe mode and then zoom right in on this. And hopefully you can see this area here has these jagged lines. Now if we set this from no multi-sample to multi-sample 8, that should try and smooth that area out and just give a nicer, cleaner overall look. Next, let's jump down to the navigation tab. And currently we have this smooth view set to 200. That's the time it takes to zoom into something when you select it. So to demonstrate the current speed of our smooth view, let's go up to view and then just choose frame selected or use the period key or full stop if you'd rather on the numpad. If we set that right down to zero instead, everything is just a little bit quicker and snappier. Auto perspective is also on by default now. What this means is if we go into our front orthographic view by pressing one on the numpad, and then begin to use the middle mouse to rotate out of that view, you can see it's automatically switched us into a perspective view. Now, personally, I really like this, since you can still toggle orthographic and perspective with the five key on the numpad, as I'm doing there. But if you don't like that behavior, this is where you'll find that setting. Auto depth is another controversial one, but it's very, very useful to know that it's there. So with this disabled as it is by default, the position of our cursor isn't really going to affect where the pivot of the camera rotating is going to be. Since this monkey is the last thing that we've selected, we're rotating around this. And if we select the camera, we're still really rotating around the monkey. That is until we view up on it, frame selected. And now we're going to be rotating around that. This auto depth allows us to be able to use the position of objects underneath our cursor to inform that rotation point. So what I'll do is I'll press five on the numpad just to switch back into perspective mode there and frame up on this camera by pressing the full stop on the numpad or the period if you rather. And as you can see, we're rotating around that. And as soon as we place our cursor over the monkey there, you can see we're starting to now rotate around that point and generally helps for navigating around the scene but it can get a bit annoying so it's definitely worth knowing that that option is hidden here in the preferences and you might want to toggle it on and off depending on your circumstances next up jumping over to the system tab we can take a look at our cycles rendering options here so depending on your graphics card will depend on your options that you've got available i've got a geforce and nvidia card so i can enable this cuda here there's also the option to recruit in our cpu here to get even further speed ups so I'm going to enable that there. And then once that's done, we can actually close out the user preferences. So I'm going to left click and drag from the 3D view top right corner into the preferences and just close that out. And that means that we can now come to our render tab in our properties window, switch over to cycles here. And now we can switch from CPU to GPU and get some rendering speed ups. And that would usually mean that down in the performance section, we would need to change our tile sizes to benefit. The tiles are those little orange squares darting around in a spiral constructing our image. Usually rendering on the CPU would mean smaller tile sizes, give better render times, and the GPU would mean a larger tile size. So I wasn't really sure what the best tile size would be for trying to use both at the same time. So I ran a few tests rendering out this very simple cube scene many times with different combinations of tile sizes and put the results into this simple chart. The main takeaway is that for using the CPU and the GPU at the same time, the optimal setting was around 64. This is also true for the CPU on its own, but if just using the GPU on its own, then probably somewhere around 256 is still best for this tile size setting. So in my case, because I'm using the CPU and the GPU, I'm gonna to stick to around 64. All right, let's talk more about render engines. In a modeling project, it's usually unlikely you'd use much of Cycles, though you may like to switch to that for final presentation renders. However, a VFX project set in space, on the other hand, that's using a lot of lighting and shading, you may find yourself much more in Cycles or perhaps a real-time engine. And in Blender 2.8, that would be Eevee. Eevee's render mode gives us lots of post-processing options and gives us a similar ability to create elaborate materials using the shader editor. 
While still set to EV, we have access to the solid shading mode. We can also get to these options using the Z key. You can see we're currently in the solid shading. This solid shading viewing mode doesn't demand as much resources to display what we need on screen. But still, this solid shading in itself has lots of useful viewing options that we can see in the shading pull down menus. That brings us to the Workbench engine, which removes a lot of the fancy EV rendering power, but keeps us light and fast while modeling. EV and Cycles Material Preview Mode has now disappeared. We now just have these three options. Though to understand what's going on here, it's probably best to just think of the rendered mode here, like a second solid shading mode where the settings can be found in the render tab of the properties window rather than the pull down in the shading menu. If we switch over to our solid shading and show that pull down, a lot of those same options here are basically duplicated here. So we can kind of just think of our rendered mode just like a second solid shading mode. It also means if we jump over to our materials that the material settings are super simple and removes any of the EV or cycle specific settings there. While we're here, let's make a simple color change and set our material to a type of blue. This should show in both solid shading mode and in our rendered mode, which is just really, as we were saying, just like our second solid shading setup. One difference between rendered and solid shading in the workbench, however, is that our color management, if we find that in our renders tab and come down to the bottom here, color management is only going to affect our rendered mode. Also notice that our view transform now is set to filmic by default. So we're currently in rendered mode. So let's press Z and come over to solid shading mode, change this to high contrast, maybe increase the exposure. We have further settings here if we wanted to use curves. And as you can see, none of that was being updated in the viewport there. But if we press Z and go over to rendered mode, you can see our exposure is definitely kicking in here. So I'm just going to set that down to zero, maybe try something more medium in the contrast. And here we can see some basic changes between our rendered and solid viewing modes. Before making further changes here, I'm going to make mention of these various workspace tabs along the top, which are various windows layout settings and modes designed for certain tasks. We began on the general layout tab, but I'd like to duplicate that and just alter a custom workspace. So I'm going to click on plus here and duplicate the current one, which is currently called layout 001. I'm going to double click in there and let's say we're making a hard surface modeling custom layout. So let's just call it that, but obviously name that to whatever you would prefer. And for this, we're not going to need this second window here. We don't need the timeline or the shader editor for our modeling. So I'll just choose to go from the bottom right here and left click and drag down until we see this large arrow pointing into the shader editor, let go, and then we can collapse that into a larger overall 3D view. Instead of beginning with a mesh monkey, let's delete that with the X key, press shift A to bring up our add menu. And I'm going to bring back our faithful dependent cube. I'll also come over to the materials and then from the pull down, bring our material back. I'm just gonna call this blue and then hop back over to our render settings here. So now quickly, I'm gonna go and walk through two different viewing looks. One set of values for solid shading and another set of values for rendered mode. So for example, in solid shading, we could use perhaps from the studio lighting setups, this one here, just a little brighter. And if we switch over to rendered view, we could perhaps use one of the matte caps. Switch to matte caps, and then from here, perhaps this one will give us some good results. To demonstrate the next thing, I'm going to duplicate this cube with Shift D and just move it along the X axis and then move over to it. Tab into edit mode, press 3 to switch to face select, select the top face, press I to inset, and then E to extrude down, and then Alt A to deselect everything, and then tab back into object mode. I'm still in rendered view, so it's these settings which are controlling what we see here. And something that we could do is add on our shadows, but just lessen the impact of that a little bit. So take it down to say something like 0.2. So we can just see some shadow outline here. We can play with the orientation of that by clicking on our little cog icon and then left clicking and dragging on here. I'm just going to more or less leave that as it was. And for solid shading mode, we'll just leave it without. Again, another option for a rendered view could be to add a kind of ambient occlusion to this. Back in 2.7, that used to be hidden somewhere in the sidebar, but now we have it actually in the shading options themselves as we can see under cavity. And if I uncheck that again, you can just look to see into the creases here that it'll darken when we enable the cavity option again, the strength of which is controlled with our valley setting here. And we also have this ridge setting, which is basically the exposed corners, many areas that you might expect to have been slightly worn away. I'm just gonna set these down to be a little bit more subtle at 0.5. And we can also control the type. So I'm gonna set this to both. 
so that we're using some screen space settings and world space settings. We'll see the screen space ridge settings just gives us a very tight, precise kind of slightly chipped away edge there, which is quite cool. So I'm just gonna make that quite subtle at 0.3. And for the valleys, again, we get a very tight, dark line in there. And I'm gonna set that to 0.6. And then if I deselect with Alt A, we can watch for the very outline here and potentially use our outline option just to help separate objects away from each other. So if I shift D to duplicate that there and then toggle our outline, we can watch for the intersection of these points here. And with that enabled, we get a little bit of separation there, which is pretty handy. So I'm just gonna X to delete that and leave the outline setting on, and then we'll come to the background. So if I was to take this into wireframe by pressing Z, we can see our wireframe is black since we don't have it selected. So Alt A just to keep it deselected for the moment. And then let's switch over to our world tab and take a look at the viewport display. And I'm just going to set this to be a little bit lighter. Well, only slightly though. And we can see it's not actually gonna have any effect just yet. If we were to switch into rendered view, we should be able to see that having an effect as we can see there. So I'm just gonna leave this on at around 0.3. And for our solid shading mode, it's gonna reset that back to our theme settings by default. But if we use our pull down menu and set the background from the theme to the world, that should unify our viewport background in our world tab there between solid, rendered, and wireframe. Just a quick note, if using the grid quite a bit, you could see that the having a lighter background makes that harder to hop. The contrast isn't as great. So it's worth bearing in mind that with our preferences here, we can still tweak many things in our theme. So if we come under the 3D view, the grid is actually the first thing we can see. And if we really wanted to, we could really crank that up into a much brighter setting. Again, many of these things are obviously personal preference. It's also worth considering how things are looking in edit mode. So I'm selecting the cube there and tabbing into edit mode. It's worth noting that the way this shades, we can see here our viewport overlays and we're also showing our faces, which I'm just going to leave on for now, as that will also help us to display the fact that we have our X-ray here as well, which you pretty much always want on when you're in your wireframe mode. We can kind of see that just here as well, allowing us to select through the mesh. I'm going to jump into solid shading mode just to demonstrate this next thing, which is back face culling. So I'm going to delete this face here. And as you can see, we can see through the mesh. We can also see the reverse sides of our polygons that are facing away from us here. And one way to demonstrate that is to come over to our shading here and you can see back face culling is an option. And now it's fairly clear which way our polygons are actually facing. Personally, I think this is so important. That I quite like the idea of having this set also in rendered mode back face culling. It's also very important to bear this in mind for other rendering engines as well. Just a quick note on this, if we do jump into EV, for example, let's switch over to the material preview. We can definitely still see our back faces there. So let's get about culling. And that in EV is handled on a per material basis. So if we select our materials tab and then find our settings, you can see there's back face culling per material. That's just a quick aside for a similar option that we might like to use in EV. At this point, that might be all the things that we want to do and change with the scene. And so what we might like to do at that point is just come down to our file menu, come down to our defaults, and then save this as our startup file. That way, each time you load Blender, all of this stuff is gonna be set up for us. Let's take a look at some of the add-ons that we might enable that come bundled with Blender. So again, these can be found in our preferences. So I'm gonna hit F4 there and take a look at the add-ons tab. And we could filter the list of add-ons here in a few different ways. So we can use our categories here, or we could use a text filter. I'm gonna type in display because display tools was one of the main add-ons that we used to use in 2.7. But as you can see, that is not there. So I'm going to remove that and just close this again. Now, the main reason we used that display tools really was just because it gave us a very easy way to toggle a wireframe on and off for everything. And in this version of Blender, we're not really gonna struggle being able to set that up quite quickly and easily ourselves. So to show that, I'm going to give this a little bit more interest. So tabbing into edit mode, right click, subdivide a couple of times, and then let's go shift A and add in a cylinder, for example. Let's press G and move that off to the side. And now if we come over to our viewport overlays menu, we can see down here we have a wireframe toggle that we can switch on, which is exactly what we want. 
but we don't want to have to keep digging in a menu for that. We want it on a hotkey. So one thing that we could do here is right click and add it to our quick favorites menu. And that means that we can hit Q and then we'll find our wireframe toggle within that menu. That's not perfectly ideal though, because that quick favorites menu is context sensitive. So I tab into edit mode and press Q again. It says no menu items found. So I would need to add that in again. So what I'll do is tab into object mode. I'm going to come over to this pull down menu. I'm going to right click and then remove it from the quick favorites and right click it again and instead assign a shortcut. And now we can just simply press a key. And for that, I'm just going to use the semicolon key. And now when pressing the semicolon key, it should toggle that on pretty easily. And then even if we're in edit mode, we can toggle that on and off again with the semicolon key, as you can see in this other object. Another add-on that we found very useful was the layer management add-on. But again, that doesn't seem to be something that we need to worry about anymore since we have all our collections set up, since we have a more versatile system with the collections. So for example, we can easily name what all this is about and then select the main scene collection, press C, and that will add in another collection, which I can just double click on and give a name to keep things organized. And then we can just select an object, press M to move it into any of these collections or create yet another one. And something particularly cool about this sort of stuff is that we can left click and drag them to reorganize the structure and create sub collections, which means the level of organization that we can get out of here is, is pretty useful. Now, something we can do is use our filters here. At the moment, we can just see this eye icon. We can actually also enable many other options here. For example, whether it's going to be rendered or not, and that will pop that up on the right hand side of our outliner. And we can just disable or enable various different collections that we have. So really useful stuff there. There are some add-ons though that we used to use in 2.7 that we would again still use in 2.8. For example, the loop tools add-on. So let's just enable that there and we can close that out again. Now if I select this cube, tab into edit mode, right click, you can see at the top there we've got our loop tools. One of the ones I particularly like on here is if we just press one, select that single vertex there, right click, go to loop tools and then create a circle. You can see it's fashioned the surrounding vertices into a nice circular shape for us. All right, let's take a look at another add-on. For example, the copy attributes add-on. This is still going to be found in 2.8. So I'm just going to type in copy into the filter there, enable it. And this works just as it has done in the past. So for example, we can go control C and we're going to get our copy attributes menu. Most of this is all grayed out because we need to select two objects. So I'm just gonna make something a little bit different on these. So with this, I'm gonna come over to the modifiers, for example, give this a subdivision surface, as well as a bevel perhaps. Let's put the bevel first, why not? And then what I'll do is select the cube, shift select the cylinder, go control C, and then copy selected modifiers. And it's gonna choose from the cylinders modifiers that we've got. Let's say we just wanna only take the bevel modifier and then just click okay. If we take a look, that's exactly what we've got. So that's particularly useful for copying a lot of mirror, bevel, subdivision modifiers that you've already got set up on one object and you just wanna quickly pass that on to another. A particularly useful add-on for hard surface modeling is to come and find our Boolean related add-on, the Bool tool. So just have this enabled there. And then that means that we can take one object. I'm gonna press G and then Shift Z. Just move that to intersect with the corner of this cube. Shift Select the cube and then go control and minus on the numpad. And then as we can see there, we're creating a difference operation there in our Boolean modifier. And it's all automatically set up for us. So it's also changed our cylinder object into a bounding box there as well. So let's take a quick look at what's happening there. We can come over to our object properties, come down to the viewport display. You can see that's set there to bounds, but we could change that to say wireframe instead if we wanted. And so that brings me to another point, which is if we want to tweak that a little bit, we can open up our add-ons, open up the options here. And in our options here, we can choose to display it as wireframe instead of the bounding box. Also, we can see the various shortcuts available to us here. So I'm just going to close that out and add in a UV sphere this time. Drop that over to this corner instead. Shift select the cube, control minus on the numpad. And as you can see, it's switched it to a wireframe instead of the bounds this time. Another quick note to add about the Bool tool is that we can find some extra options in our sidebar. So I'm gonna open that with the N key, pop down to the edit tab that we've got down the side there. And we can find this section here to do with this particular Boolean brush as it calls it. And we can toggle the visibility 
or the effect rather, of that particular Boolean object or brush. And this should be very similar if we select the cylinder over here. But if we select the cube, we'll see our two different brushes affecting our mesh here. And we can change the order of them. We can toggle them on and off and we can decide to hide them or apply them all just to potentially simplify things down for us. Another add-on that we can get to is the F2 add-on. This is another good modeling add-on. So I'm going to enable that there. Tab into edit mode on this. Press 2 to grab just these two edges there. Shift select in and then Shift D to duplicate them. And I'm just going to move them down on this Y axis just to separate them from the main mesh really. And now if I press 1 to switch into vertex selection and then just select that one vertex there, this is all we actually need for F2 to know how to create an entire face out of this. So if I just press F now and then cancel the transform by pressing the right click, you can see it's created a face for us. So this is basically just giving us extra function on top of our already cool fill command that we would get with the F key normally. Another add-on that isn't strictly modeling related, but it's just so important. It's always worth pointing this one out. And it's to do with shading in this case, the Node Wrangler. But it's worth noting that this isn't gonna work because we're in the Workbench engine. So I'm just gonna switch over to the EV engine just to demonstrate this and press F4, load up the preferences. Let's find our Node Wrangler add-on. Just make sure it's enabled because this is gonna give us so much more control and features and tools and shortcuts for that matter whilst working in our shader editor here. For example, if, if I select this principled BSDF shader and press Control T, it should automatically create some useful nodes for us and hook it into the right socket. This image texture though, I don't want, so I'm gonna actually switch it with Shift S, another little option from the Node Wrangler there. Let's change that from an image texture to a noise texture. And we can see its effects in the viewport there. Rather than seeing the shading though, we can very quickly show what any node is doing by just Control Shift clicking on it. So control shift click there and you'll see the grayscale output of this noise texture. Or if we wanted to see what this texture coordinates node was doing, we could control shift that and that will automatically hook it to this output viewer. And again, same with the mapping node. All the viewer node is really, it's just a temporary emission shader and we can get rid of it quickly and easily by just control shift clicking on the shader. This add-on clearly does much more than that and it's definitely worth checking out some of the shortcuts here to really see how this can benefit your shader experience or your node wrangling. All right, our last add-on here is gonna be the import images as planes add-on. So we want to go F4 and take a look at our add-ons and then just type in images here. Just make sure this is enabled. And then once we've got that in place, that means that we can then find an extra option in our import menu, the images as planes at the bottom there, or we could go shift A, add in an image, images as planes. That gives us all these options on the right hand side here. First of all, we just need to find some kind of image or actually a movie, why not? And then also I'm gonna make this shadeless. And the cool thing about this add-on is it's going to bring it in and recognize the dimensions of the footage or the image and conform our mesh geometry plane into that same aspect ratio. So let's press G and then move that out of the way, scale that up. And now it's ready to go and just place it in the background of whatever you need in this case. And this even happens to be a movie. So I can hit space and we can feel like we're in space as the animation plays. So that should wrap up this Blender 2.8 setup video. Many thanks for watching. This is AD Burrows and I'll see you in the next one.